the back? Hearing are the kids in the back of the class, right? <laughs> All right. How do you like my graphic there? It's, it's old. I can't find a good one. It's like this. The new one? I searched and searched, but this is, this is that big on the internet, so... <laughs> he said, are you hearing? I'm so sorry. <laughs> we just, we have a pitiful number of hearing people. I'm deaf. Like, how wonderful. Yeah. Now, please don't misunderstand. We, we talk very, very clearly and very bluntly to the, to the, uh, within the deaf world. So I'm not calling you pitiful. <laughs> no, that's really cool. It's good. This is um, what an interpreter does. Okay, have you ever noticed, uh, if maybe you can kind of see something on top, there's, this is an old, old picture, but there's a, there's a dish on the side to be able to receptive skills, catch everything that comes in. Okay, there's a recorder on the top, that's a tape recorder, but most of us will know what that is, okay, <laughs> okay, and that's because you've got to remember everything that went on, and if you're behind, you've got to keep signing, and hopefully you still have it recorded. Uh, there are how many hands there? Four hands to be able to get it all in. Yeah, to be able to get it. And there's a, a boot uh, that happens in case uh, the interpreter is making mistakes. The deaf can push a button, boom, boom, and the interpreter can get it right because we're always getting feedback, right? And uh, so there's just so many different parts of interpreting. Interpreting is a hard thing. Being involved in deaf ministry as a hearing person, we just have to change our brains entirely, almost. Because what we're doing is functioning in a world that does not think like we think. I just saw a video the other day about uh, how much a person gets by watching the lips. A hearing person. Not, it wasn't about deaf. It's about hearing people. And what, this, what they did, they did an experiment and they chose words that were very similar on the lips. Or very similar in sound. They sounded very, very similar. Okay, but you could not tell what they were until you saw the lips. And when you saw the lips, you knew the difference. And you don't have to be looking at the lips, just, it just, you just understand that. It's amazing what we pick up that we do not think that we're picking up. And it's amazing what we do as hearing people and the experiences that we have that deaf people don't have. We had a, a, one time a, uh, uh, an interpreter was interpreting along in a church service, there was the offertory and there was a trumpet playing the offertory. So the interpreter knew the song. It's like, oh, cool, I'm just going to throw this in there. So the interpreter started signing the words for the song. There were no words, just a, tur just a trumpet. But he was interpreting those words so the deaf could benefit from the offertory. A deaf person afterwards said, I never knew that. The interpreter said, what? He said, I never knew a trumpet had words. And we think that's funny, but, but their experience is very different than ours. And we do not have the visual experience that a deaf person has, unless we really, really focus on that. And so interpreting, being involved in deaf ministry, we almost have to change our brains. I saw a, a, um, well, a lady at our, our ministry who has a cochlear implant. And she, her name is Vicki, she gave me permission to use this story, but... Um, she has this cochlear implant. When she's with deaf people, she basically just turns it off. She's deaf. She's just deaf. But then when she comes with hearing people, she turns her, turns her hearing aid on. She'll come in the office and say, I'm ears off today, so it's all in sign language. She'll come in and say, oh, I'm hearing today. So, okay. So she'll tell me whether she's deaf or hearing. Well, she was working with in, the, in a certain area of our ministry where there are a lot of deaf people, uh, well, were several deaf people, and... So they were doing everything in sign language, and she came out to the area where hearing people were. And so she, I began to speak with her. This was early on in our ministry, in her, mini, her time with our ministry. And so she, it was so strange, she looked at me and said, wait, 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 wait. I started talking to her because she could read lips pretty well. And with her cochlear in, she's like a hearing person. So she said, wait, just, just wait, wait. She didn't have her cochlear, cochlear in. Said, wait just a second. She went, Hearing. Okay. And so 
She was saying, I have to take off my deaf brain and put on my hearing brain, which we don't think that way a lot of times. We, we tend to think everything is just the same. That's because who we are as hearing people, we assume a lot in church, we assume a lot in ministry. What a deaf person's experience is, is very, very different from ours. Here's a, one of the reasons interpreting is hard. Okay, it says at the bottom, the chief of Manasseh tribe was Gamaliel, the son of Peta, whatever, brother of Amajada, what, what, I can't say those words. Okay, have you ever tried to interpret stuff like that? Uh, and it's just tough. And the interpreter over there is going like, okay, what do I do with this? Because it's often very, very difficult. We deal with a uh, hearing world. In our hearing world, we'll say a lot of words, but it's okay. Because we know we're not supposed to understand them. In the deaf world, if it's interpreted, like I'm supposed to understand that. And so it gets to be a challenge with them. We have to, and you've noticed it through the course of the day, change our language. So we don't sound like a normal hearing person. It's a really odd thing. If we're doing SIMCOM, we have to do that. If we're focusing on the deaf world, we have to throw out English entirely and talk like a deaf person. Last year at ASL Institute, uh, one of the topics was expansion techniques, seven expansion techniques. And one of the exercises in doing that is stop thinking like a hearing person and think like a deaf person. How does a deaf person explain this? Like uh, temple, the sign for temple, okay? How many of you are familiar with the word temple, okay? Several of you, okay? There's the sign for temple. So in sign language, that's the sign for temple, but how would you say that? You say temple, okay, well, what is that? Is that like such and such Baptist temple or such and such faith temple or whatever? What is that? Or is it in the Bible, the temple uh, in Jerusalem? So you have to kind of expand upon that. So you know the Jews place, they all going up every year, temple, up on the mount, Jerusalem, there, temple. To say temple, which we as hearing people know, oh, Jesus went up to the temple, we know exactly what that was. And so you might need to expand upon things to make it more clear in uh, the deaf language of the way they do things. This verse deals with deacons. But I got to thinking about it, how it applies with hearing people. We as interpreters, we as deaf ministry workers, let me ask you this. How many of you are involved in the deaf ministry yourself, actively involved? Okay. All right. So uh, how many of you know sign language of some sort? A little bit. Okay. All right. So, so the, the, uh, in, a, in a big way, deaf ministry is kind of like this thing with deacons. Now, deaf Deaf ministry people are not deacons. I'm not saying that, okay? I'm not trying to get to overlap with, with church polity here. However, when the, when the apostles were, were so overwhelmed with all of the responsibilities in the church and the preaching and taking care of these people and these people and doing all this, deacons were chosen, and the Scripture says they chose out seven minutes of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, and wisdom to be appointed over that business. What happens in the deaf ministry is your pastor doesn't know sign language. Does your pastor know sign language? Well, yours does. Okay, yeah, okay. So little, your pastor may know sign language, but a little bit. It's like, okay, so, oh, you know sign language? It's yours. And all of a sudden, that responsibility is transferred. It's like, oh, but I, I you may know you may know, uh, I, mean, you, I may know sign language, but I don't know ministry. I don't know what you know. I don't know the Bible like you know it. And, but we're given that responsibility. It's not quite the same as deacons, but there's a comparison there. And we have to think about, okay, what do I not know? What do I need to get from my pastor? How do I need to help my pastor understand the deaf ministry? Because quite frankly, in, in uh, Bible colleges where pastors are trained, and even in, in church ministries, if, there, if a pastor comes up through the school of hard knocks into the ministry, there's usually no one that teaches them about deaf ministry. So they're just left there without any, without any really resources or knowledge to give to the interpreter. So you are the professional. You're the one that is the, the, who the pastor is depending upon to be able to do the ministry. It's kind of a strange thing. 
And so it's, it's almost backwards because like, well, I'm not, but, I, but, I'm, but I'm not the pastor. But you get to be called upon like the pastor. We often have at our ministry, of course, of course, I'm ordained in the ministry, but we'll have deaf people come in and ask like biblical questions. They'll come in and say, IRS form, it, do I owe this? Oh, no, that's a fake. Oh, it's a fake. Do I throw it away? Yeah, you can throw that away. It's like, wait a minute, I just took a lot of responsibility there. <laughs> you know? But if it's a fake thing, I'm going to tell the guy, yes, it's fake. And then he's asking me what to do with it. It's like, ah. Uh... So I've told him before, I don't know, it's up to you. It's fake. You know, and they'll say, well, it's fake. Maybe I ought to throw away. You think I ought to throw away? They're still going to ask. And so you feel like almost mama sometimes and to the people you're working with. They don't want to make a mistake. In the hearing world, they have had so many mistakes that they don't know what to do with it. They think, you know, okay, I need somebody to rely upon. So here, now the pastors rely upon you. Now the deaf are relying upon you. And you're going like, all I had was a sign language class. You ever, can you, some of you are laughing, so you kind of relate to what I'm saying. It's a challenge when you don't know how to deal with all these, this stuff that you're dealing with. And so, in, in many ways, the deaf ministry is like this. You get that responsibility. And so, here are some of the areas, as far as deaf ministry is concerned, some of the things that we have to deal with, with deaf ministry. I just threw down things that came to mind, actually, very quickly with this. Sign language. How easy is sign language? It depends, <laughs> okay. Yeah, you, you can sign the words, but the language, getting it across the way a deaf person understands it, it, it takes a while to learn. And sometimes it takes like, years. In fact, let's see, I've been in this since 1976. I'm still learning stuff. <laughs> you just are, you just are. And Back when I learned sign language, there was, there was hardly any classes to go to, so, uh, so school of hard knocks for me, and learning what you can, when you can. Sign language is a challenge. Deaf culture, what about that? That's a whole different way of thinking about things. In fact, I believe, don't hold me to this, but I think next year in ASLI we're going to be doing deaf culture, and uh, we're going to be talking about how it's different and how we can can. Uh, adapt ourselves into that way of thinking. Because if we know what the way, the way deaf people are thinking, then we can match with what they're doing. If you don't know a person's culture, you don't know what they're thinking. Let me give you a quick example of that. Not deaf, but I was in the Philippines, and um, you know, I, I, would, I typically raise my eyebrows for different things. You know. The missionary I was with said, don't ever do that, especially to a woman. And I went, okay, Why? And they said, that means yes. And so, like, you could be asking the lady on a date. I said, whoa, 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 just by raising my eyebrows? Yeah, because the way they think and the way we think as Americans is totally different. And there are multiple examples. You've probably been in a church where a missionary shared some example of being able to foul up things pretty well. Uh, language is different and culture is different. One missionary from, from England, he was in England at the time, and his wife did not show up to church. And so he just said, well, they said, Where, where's your wife? She said, oh, well, she's under the weather. And everybody was totally shocked. She's under the weather. Yes, she's under the weather today. Okay. All right, pastor. It's okay. So he asked her, I said, what did I just say? He said, you said she's drunk. <laughs> and so the way they think and the way we think is different. Even to say I'm a hearing person, to say I'm hearing, that implies certain things to the deaf. If you say, I can hear, that's different than if you say, I'm hearing. Because deaf people look at hearing people as, well, they don't know anything about us. They, we can't trust them. And so it can be a really, real big challenge. So, deaf culture. Bible knowledge. Bible, have you ever heard your pastor say something you had no clue what he just said? Does that ever happen to you? Okay, yeah. Now, how do you interpret that? You can, you can sign the words he said, but... How do you get that across? How can a deaf person understand you when, you when you don't know what you're signing, when you don't know what the meaning of it is? Every year in our summer training with the ASL Institute, what we do is we talk about this process. I think we did it in, in the one that you were in even this summer, uh, was that when a pastor is speaking, he has a mindset of what he wants to say. 
So he takes that and then he takes it and puts it into words and the interpreter or the hearing people in the congregation listen to it and they go, okay, I got that. I understand that. Then the interpreter takes that and says, okay, here's what that is. I've got to put it into signs. And if we do it effectively, then the deaf person over here who's watching the signs gets this idea, which was the same as what the interpreter had, which is the same as what the pastor had. If we don't do it effectively, it gets switched somewhere in the process, and sometimes we say the opposite of what the pastor was planning, trying to get across. And so it can really be a challenge if we don't know what the Bible is saying about a particular thing, or if we don't have the knowledge that the pastor has about a particular topic, which usually we don't. You know, he's speaking from his study all week long, and we've got that long to make it perfect. And so it can be a challenge. Uh, servant's heart. Deaf ministry is filled with people that are servant because we're serving that deaf community. And yet, there are deaf people involved in the deaf ministry that are not servants by nature, by gifting, by spiritual gifts, that are lions, so to speak, or that are administrators, or that are prophets. And those people have a special place in the ministry, the deaf ministry. But uh, a servant's heart, we are there to help that need, to meet the need of deaf people, to help them spiritually. One of the most exciting things to me is when a deaf person will like go like, oh, if they just understand all of a sudden. And when they do, to me, that's just like, that was just wonderful. I just, that was just so fun. Because you know that you were part of the process where they got it. And it's not being a part of the process as much as it is, they got it. They, I've known this for how many years, and they've just now got that. And so it's a phenomenal thing. Being patient with the deaf. Deaf people, working with deaf requires a lot of patience, doesn't it? We have to really spend, spend our efforts to just take time with them. I mentioned Ray Short earlier today, how that he would just, he would just talk, 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 and I'm sitting there, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not that guy. <laughs> I don't want to sit there and listen to all that story. He'll tell me old news, sometimes he tells me new news. Sometimes he's talking about a Bible story that I've known for a long time. Sometimes he's talking about a new Bible story that I've never heard, at least that way. And, <laughs> and sometimes he's bringing out names of characters in the Bible. Like, I know I've read that name, but I have no idea what that story was about, what that account was about. So we have to be patient with them and work with them their way. Bob Himes, missionary of the Philippines, said it this way. If they don't understand the way you sign then sign the way they understand. That's huge. And being patient with them sometimes requires, okay, they didn't get it, let me try again. Let me, go, let me back up a few steps and come at this thing whole, uh, all again to see what I can do. Interpreting, I already touched on that earlier, but interpreting is one of those challenges of the ministry that when you're done, how many, would you interpret, who, who interprets in the church, okay? Mostly in the front here, okay, so y'all interpret the church. When you had finished interpreting, are you like, oh, wow, I'm ready for, you know, uh, I'm ready for a nap. <laughs> People say, do your hands get tired? No, but my brain is exhausted. Yeah, and so it can be a real, real challenge. And so you have, interpreting is something we have to learn and learn to deal with. Also with interpreting, do y'all remember the message when you interpret it? You, you do? You actually do? Really? Okay. 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 So you're, you're focused on the message more and you remember it then. Okay. I don't remember it. I mean, I, somebody will say, what was that verse, the third verse down? And I was like, I have no idea. Ask Diane. She wrote the notes. You know, and I, yeah, I'm, I get bits and pieces. I mean, if there are five things being said, if there are three, it's a little easier. But if there are like five things being said, it's like, oh, that's tough. Or if one of those points has 15 subpoints, uh, or maybe not subpoints, but just there's a lot of things involved, and you come back to that and they go down the next one. It's exhausting, and the process of interpreting is something that, quite frankly, nobody else in your church understands unless they are an interpreter for Spanish speaking people or other language. They just don't understand why that's such a challenge. They just don't get it. And so, and let me say on the interpreter just for a second, they also don't understand, the hearing people in your church, 
don't understand why you can't just like be done interpreting and go talk with them. Because the deaf ministry requires you to be there for them. So before church, you're in the deaf section. After church, you're in the deaf section. All my friends just went home. Oh no, I wanted to talk to somebody. Well, this day and age, we've all got texting and all of that. But still, they don't get it why you're focused on that ministry so much. But you have to be. Some of the most valuable time we have with deaf people is before church and after church. Because they're sitting there in that context. They want to know something. They want to know what was said. They want to know uh, something from their family that they're, they're relating to what just was said. And so, okay, how does this apply? I had a deaf person ask me the other day. It was really, really interesting. I didn't know how to answer the question. I alluded to it earlier. He said, what does it mean, serve God? How can I serve God? And he was asking for a practical answer. And I had to stop and take a double take. Because, you know, go to church, read your Bible, all this thing. But those are not, that's not what he was asking. He wanted something to do. And I was trying to think, okay, what can he do? So I said, okay, so at work, when somebody else is being mean and all that stuff, and you're nice to them, you're serving God. He went, oh, that's serving God. I said, well, yeah, in a sense, that's serving God. Because you're being the testimony to that person. Oh, testimony, like I have to tell, I have to witness to them? No, no that's not it. What you are, by your, by your, just the way you're handling this situation, you are being a testimony. I had to stop and think through, what does it mean to serve God? I've been serving God all my life. Well, it seems like. Uh, you know, since, since getting in ministry, for sure, and well, before ministry, that was the focus of my life. And how do you explain that to somebody else who now is just now trying to ask that question as an older man? It's like, oh, that's, that's a challenge. And so with, as the interpreter in the ministry, you are faced with challenges that nobody else in that church understands. And so it can be a real, real uh, eye-opener. Transportation, biggie, getting deaf people to church. That's always a, a challenge. And uh, what we'll do is pick up deaf people. If they're close to us, we'll go pick them up. Uh, Diane and I, one lady had, had surgery. She couldn't drive for a while. And so Diane and I would go down to her house, pick her up, and take her to church. And uh, somebody else doesn't drive. We'd make sure they get a, a ride to church. When we're out of town, how do you get to church? You know, and try to work out how they can get to church on a bus, man, bus route or somebody coming and picking them up. All that's involved in the deaf ministry. And then I would put an exclamation point after ministry because it's, it's ministry. It's service. It's service for God in this area of deaf. So maybe you have some thoughts or questions that you're facing in your ministry or challenging situations or just like, hey, how would you handle uh, nothing, nothing super specific that, would, that ought to be answered by a pastor per se, but um, anything that you would think of that's like, okay, how would we do this or what? Do you have any comments or, or additions to what I've said there? Anything. We've got about five minutes to do this. We've got plenty of time. Nobody? Yeah. Real quick, talking with, about your deaf culture. I've read several books. And I feel that I've kind of, kind of experienced it, but have you heard of the Big D and the Little D? Yes, Big D and Little D, deaf culture. Big D deaf culture is, is your... Um, Strictly deaf, I wouldn't say profoundly deaf, but, but it's more than just their hearing loss. It's, it's the deaf people that live and breathe deaf. Little d deaf means I can't hear. It, and that, that I haven't read up on as far as the, with the cochlear because cochlear is its own little thing right now. You've got deaf people that they, they don't want to be deaf. They're, not, they're, they're cochlear. They're in between that area. Yes. Yes. Big D deaf people are the ones that grew typically are the ones that grew up in the deaf world. They have full culture of deaf. They may or may not understand the hearing world, and they look. They do look down upon anybody that's trying to walk away or diminish who they are as big D deaf. So the little D deaf are just those, everybody else. 
And so it is a challenge. The cochlear thing, the cochlear issue is really huge. And a lot of kids are getting cochlears now. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But from the deaf culture point of view, it is terrible. <laughs> because they're not laughing at that. So <laughs> but it's, it's terrible because that now this child has no, they cannot experience what it's like to be deaf. And to a deaf person, that's just terrible. Uh, Alan Snare, when his children were born, he, his first child was born hearing, oh, good, 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 you happy, good. Second child was born deaf. Oh, you'd think he's giving out cigars. If he was unsaved, he might have. Uh, but he didn't smoke. So, um, but anyway, so he, he gave, uh, he, he, was just, he was just elated. The third child was born deaf as well. Oh, it was just like the best thing that ever happened. And there were hearing people that said, why is he happy they're deaf? You know, because he's, he's not big D deaf to the exclusion of everybody, but he knows what it's like to, to live in that world. So big D, little D deaf is a, is a big issue. Uh, not an issue as much as just a big thing. It's really there. And people that don't function deaf fully, the, the deaf world may look down upon them. And, and by the way, uh, when you read something like that, we're all generalizing. So, so it's very difficult to say this is the way it is because everybody's individual. Well, yeah. It's just that I feel that with experience. That's why I bring that yeah, up. yeah. Sure. And so we did, and he seemed to adapt to it so much so that um, we wanted to uh, do, uh, implant him with another one. He wanted it. Well, once we came down here, once he got into the deaf school, all of a sudden he seemed to not like it. And I, I can't really say, you know, definitively if it was that, but knowing what I know about that deaf school, I would not at all be surprised. Yeah, there's a very big bias in, in many deaf communities, in the, especially among the big D deaf, against cochlear. So he don't wear them. He stopped wearing them all Yeah, that, that's kind of sad uh, in a sense. I mean, you, you've invested a lot there. And um, maybe one day he'll go back to it, maybe not. Yeah, you know. I mean, at this point, you know, we left it up to him. We left, you know, it was his choice. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and that is it's so strange. There's there's this the I said bias. It's a prejudice, is what it is, against those others in the other group. Deaf people, big D deaf people, are prejudiced against hearing people. They don't like hearing people. Like oh, you're hearing, you know, been, you're cut off. You don't even know my experience. Up, oh, but you're hearing, you know, and so they 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 assume that I have no basis for knowing their experience, and uh, and I don't fully know their experience, but hey, I talk to Spanish-speaking people and they don't do that. <laughs> you know, it's not the same. Which, which is interesting, you say that, which is interesting because it feel, I feel like I've kind of experienced both sides because you have your deaf people that are like that, and I don't mean to, to be disrespectful to them, but yeah, they seem kind of like, eh, but then I've had a lot of deaf people that are like, you know, you're trying to learn sign language, and yep. they are more than happy to help mm -hmm. you, be patient with you, and, yeah. and work with you. Yeah. So it's a, it is a variety of people. I mean, you can't just put them in the box, but um, and and you just deal with each individual as, as best you can. Is all I, I guess you know. That's the way with any culture. It is. It is. And you're going to find people that just don't have the ability to deal with hearing people, meaning meaning they don't their 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 makeup, their psyche, so to speak. I need to use a word, but they're they're who they are. They just don't want to be around deaf people. Well, Yes, can be so rude they can be, yeah. And there's even hearing people that don't intend to be rude or mean by their glances, by their looks, by the way they go about things. It's like, okay, they don't like us. And uh, it can be a challenge. Deaf culture is huge 
it is really huge. And to be able to, to know how they feel is, is strange. We did an exercise we called uh, Experiencing Deaf Culture. And what we did was we, we blindfolded one person. I used sign language to, like on, on a whole row. That whole row was participating together. And then we had one person blindfolded or put their hands over their face or something. And then we all did something together. And that person didn't know what we did. Now, they could hear. So then they got the experience of, you know, we, said, we had everybody laugh. Like, I said, how does that feel now? It feels really awkward. They were laughing at me. But it, was, it had nothing to do about them. I just said laugh. You know, and so there's so much there that we do not perceive because we do have our hearing. And so a deaf person will read something into, into a situation that is not true. So it's, it's a fascinating thing. This is an f- amazing ministry. It's a ministry that's hugely needed. And praise the Lord for those who have the heart for this ministry, who are willing to give of themselves to be able to get into this world to make a difference in the lives of deaf people. And even some, some in the class here are not signers, per se, or not interpreters, per se. But the fact that you know more about the deaf world and the fact that you're willing to help with the deaf world and be a part of that in your church really means a lot to the deaf people. Again, in general. (laughs) Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Secular, you know, unsafe, deaf, deaf mm-hmm. community. But I don't know if you've encountered this, but have, do you interpret professionally? Like, out in the very, community? very little, very little. I was wondering if you'd in, encountered, like, um, okay, for example, I had this last year, and fortunately it really wasn't a sticking point. It didn't really come up much in the conversation, but when I got the information from my client, you know, it was a medical appointment, they gave me the pronouns to use. And it's like, well, I don't even know if it's me. You know, I mean, it's like I've heard it, I've seen it, but I don't know it. So fortunately, that client already knew me and didn't even didn't even make a big deal out of it. It was just I was there, I interpreted her, we're done, you know. But like, if that's going to be a, has that been a problem for you? Has it been a problem for me? Okay. Um, I've not interpreted recently in the professional setting, and I don't work through an agency. Uh, so we just do interpreting for, for local deaf people whom we know, and so we're able to avoid all that agency thing. And uh, pretty much policy, we pick and choose who we can who interpret for. And then they can go to an agency if they prefer something else other than what we provide. So no, I don't have ex- any experience in that area, except for what I hear in workshops. And it is challenging. My heart goes out to you. <laughs> I don't have any answers. I apologize. Can't, can't help you there. Yeah. Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and, uh, and maybe they'll get done too. So, <laughs> Our Father, thank you for the good day. Thank you for the time together. We pray that you'll help us in our ministry, help our hearts to be involved in this ministry. And Lord, we pray that, that our deaf ministries, each of them that are here, whether it be one person or a group, that we will really make a difference in the deaf world. And we pray for your help and for your guidance. Lord, we give ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we've got a break for about 15 minutes. We'll come back, let's say, 3 o'clock now.